Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. By the travelers, insurance and related financial services working to provide financial peace of mind for over 40 million Americans. By Enron, providing natural gas which holds the promise for a cleaner world and a more energy independent America. Enron Corp. and the Enron Foundation. And by Prudential Beach Securities, the investment firm with rock-solid resources and market-wise thinking in the business of making money. Produced Friday, June 22. Our panelists are Bernadette Murphy, Julius Westheimer, and Martin Zweig. Tonight's special guest is George M. Salem, Senior Banking Analyst, Prudential Beach Securities. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Well, this one was really a week for the birds. It was, first and foremost, a great week if you happened to be an owl. The Interior Department announced that it was, after all, putting the rare northern spotted owl on its list of threatened species, thereby delighting environmentalists who have used the owl as their excuse for blocking the cutting of timber in huge areas of the Northwest. But mindful of industry complaints that saving the owl could cost 30,000 jobs over the next decade, the government said it would for the moment study the matter further before promulgating specific logging restrictions. Very wise, as an owl might say. So the owls may have a few more sleepless nights ahead of them, which of course is nothing new if you happen to be an owl. But speaking of those who don't give a hoot, for people or owls, the notorious program traders were at it again today in Wall Street, violently and mindlessly turning a 23-point advance into a 45-point loss in just over an hour, one week after the poobahs of the New York Stock Exchange assured us that program trading was nothing to worry about. Especially, presumably, if you're a fat cat suffering from night and day blindness or a parrot who believes that kind of institutional propaganda. Elsewhere on the bird front, it was a better week for the doves than the hawks, as Defense Secretary Dick Cheney gave Congress a plan to cut the U.S. armed forces by 25% over the next five years. And Nelson Mandela went around cooing non-ideological words to American capitalists. As for everybody's favorite popinjay, Donald Trump, he swore that he was going to be just fine, even though at least four big Japanese and German banks made clear that they no longer wanted to play in his aviary. And Trump Taj Mahal bonds were available at 50 cents on the dollar. Meanwhile, the economy continued to limp along on one wing. Housing starts were grounded at their lowest level since 1982, but new factory orders took off smartly even in the troubled automobile sector, and cautious consumers added to their nest eggs, holding spending steady while incomes rose. Though many critics thought he was being an ostrich, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan denied that there was a credit crunch and said he thought his present policies would likely produce, as he put it, continued modest economic growth. That, of course, was bad news for the vultures in the bond market, who yearn for Greenspan to announce that the country is in a recession, and he is therefore slashing every high-flying interest rate he can catch. We tonight will look at an industry that has lately been strictly for the birds, banking, in the company of the one analyst who best saw those events coming. And let the record show that I got through this entire opening tonight without mentioning Dan Quayle. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which last week gained nearly 74 points to a new all-time record, gave back that and a bit more this week, thanks to a bad start on Monday, the third biggest drop of the year, and Friday's late program-inspired sell-off. For the week, the Dow lost more than 78 points to close at 2857.18, its lowest in nearly a month. The broader indexes, whose failure to keep up with the Dow had been signaling near-term problems with the market, followed the Dow down, though with smaller percentage losses.
But the ragged action convinced Chief Elf Ralph Akampura to switch from bullish to neutral on the technical outlook for the next three to six months, leaving Laszlo Barini as the only one of the ten contributors to our Elves Index whose vote is still outright positive. As the birds would have it, it's getting to be a lonely perch. Gold scrambled back to a few pennies over $350 an ounce, though remaining at low levels it hasn't visited since July 1986. Silver stood absolutely still. Take that, Lone Ranger. And the dollar lost ground against all major currencies except the yen. And if all this leaves you still wondering where your next buck is going to come from, try your kids' room. According to a survey by Sports Illustrated for Kids, almost two-thirds of children aged 8 to 12 said they had an average of $31 in cash in their rooms. And that doesn't even count their stocks, bonds, and options. <laughs> Marty Zweig, four weeks ago you told us that you were close to switching from neutral to bullish. Are you any closer tonight? No. <laughs> Thankfully, I stayed neutral. I was just thinking of that because the last two weeks the market's been awash. You're, I'm, you're, still, you're still in the neutral zone? My indicators are okay, but my stomach isn't. Uh, I don't like what I see in the economy. It's really bothering me. One of the uh, governors from the Federal Reserve said two weeks ago that, in his opinion, the Fed was moderately tight in their policy. It's very unusual for anybody to say that from the Fed, and I agree. So even though bonds have been okay over the past couple of months and rates haven't gone up, the Fed hasn't been pumping either. I don't like that. Are you concerned, Marty, about the program trading? I hate program trading. That is index arbitrage program trading, and I think this afternoon was a farce. And the uh, whitewash that that panel gave was disgusting. Well, there you are, being around the bush again. <laughs> right. Uh, now that we've settled that, let's get back to what you said about the economy. Is it your concern that the tightness of monetary policy, in fact, is going to push us into a deeper recession than the market anticipates? Well, it could, but uh, I don't know that monetary policy is tight, but it's certainly not loose. If you measure it by money supply, it's tight. But people can get loans if you're credit worthy, but you can't if you're going to speculate in real estate. And I think there is a slow tightening in the economy, and I definitely think it creates a big risk for the economy, and possibly we could have a recession, yes. Bernadette Murphy, you are one of our outright negative Chief Helves, mm -hmm. what's so negative about the technical action? Well, actually, I'd like to break that down into two parts, two time frames. On a short-term basis, the market is correcting the uh, part of the pullback we're having is, is because of the advance in the May-June period. I don't think it's going to be long-lasting, and I don't think it's going to be particularly deep. And I think there's a good chance the market will turn and go on to new highs. Could be 3,100. But on a longer-term basis, we have a divergence in the stock market which has persisted since last August. And that's the number of issues that are participating during the advancing periods. The advanced decline line went down again last week and this week it's headed even further, further low, uh, south. So until there is a correction in that divergence, I think there is a serious negative in the stock market. And that's what's kept me in the bearish camp. Put on your fundamental hat now. Mm -hmm. What could increase enthusiasm for those secondary stocks. Now, it's dangerous when you ask a technician to wear a fundamentalist hat. But if there was... Um, you look good in any hat. Oh, Brenda. thank you, Lou. <laughs> the, um, I think that uh, a strengthening economy, um, where we would have broad-based participation by all industries, uh, where suppliers to major companies could actually see the orders rolling in, so that they are, they are booking orders uh, and that their earnings would therefore be increasing, I think that would give much greater confidence to the markets. So you don't think this is the big sell-off? You think we're going to no. bounce back from this? Yes, I do. But you do see trouble further down the line? Yes, I do. Okay, Joyce Westheim, what do you make of what you've heard? I think uh, the market is vulnerable to more uh, sell-offs because of this uh, incredibly poor program trading that's being allowed. And I think that anybody who wants to get into the market should try to balance the risk against the reward. I think the risk today is greater than the reward short term. What could the reward be? Maybe up 10 percent, 300 points? Big deal. Uh, it's not that much. But the risk, I think, is, is pretty great considering the problems out there that we've just talked about. The deficit, the budget deficit, interest rates are not going down. The savings and loan bailout isn't finished yet. The economy is softening. Long term, Lou, I'm very positive on stocks, very. But short term, I think there could be real trouble ahead. Quick question on the program trading you mentioned. You're a retail broker. Are your customers worried about it? 
they're worried sick about it. All they see is the headlines that program trading killed the market today, and they don't see any of the good news when it goes up. Yes, they are worried sick about it. Okay, you three are also negative, and I may have to become a little more bullish on the market. But in any event, it is time now to switch from program trading to the program that helps the people's trading and answer some questions from our viewers. Marty Zweig, Royal Coley of Ithaca, New York, complains that the economists are never satisfied. On the one hand, he writes, Americans are criticized for a low savings rate. On the other hand, there appears to be hand-wringing in economic circles when Americans don't use their spending power. Where is the balance between spending and saving that is best overall for the country? Well, he's actually right. Uh, there is perhaps a trade-off that would be optimal, but I don't know where it is. Right now, the savings rate has rebounded from about 2% or less up to around 6 I'd say 6 to 8 might be normal over the last couple of decades and might be adequate, but that's less than half the savings rate in Japan or Germany. If the savings rate goes up too much, it could slow down the economy, but that's good for inflation. Uh, good for interest rates and if it goes down too much if people spend too much it could be inflationary so I don't know if there is a magic number anyhow you wouldn't favor letting the government set the magic number and enforce it God no I don't want the government to do anything <laughs> <laughs> Bernadette Murphy Louis Duberstein of Brooklyn New York is confused by reports that US taxpayers speaking to the government will pay hundreds of millions of dollars for this SNL bailout he would like a simple explanation of the mechanics of this process. Who the money's coming from, who is it going to, and why? There are 148 failed SNLs. Could be 1,700. The Resolution Trust is responsible for liquidating the assets of the failed SNLs, but many of those assets are questionable in their value. Uh, therefore, there's a shortfall. To uh, make sure that, in, that depositors get their money back, the Resolution Trust is selling 30- and 40-year bonds. The U.S. Treasury is, is providing the funds for the expenses of RLT as well as the interest on those bonds. They're doing this by increasing the size of the Treasury bills that they're selling and the bonds. This is um, causing a, an increase in the deficit of the government. And uh, the Stanford uh, Law and Policy Review has estimated the cost could be over a trillion dollars. We as taxpayers are faced with that liability trillion dollars, that gets to be serious money. <laughs> Julius Westheimer, how would you respond to Bill Latham of Sacramento, California, who writes me as follows. In recent months, I've noticed an increasing use of the 900 telephone numbers for various purposes, such as selling stock market advice, taking polls, making your own comments about certain subjects, or just to talk to someone. It appears these 900 numbers can be used for almost any purpose. The caller is charged a certain amount of money for each minute of use, and I've read two recent newspaper articles which state that these 900 number services will generate approximately $2 billion in revenue by 1992. Could one of the panelists look into this industry, give us viewers a general overview, tell us which companies, telephone or otherwise, stand to profit and benefit from these 900 telephone services? Well, Mr. Latham is right. Uh, 900 numbers are really big business. You dial 900, and you pay your 50 cents or a buck, and you get stock market advice, uh, questionable advice frequently. You hear jokes, you hear some material that's not suitable to discuss on what you refer to as this, the family hour. The problem is, <clears throat> Lewis, that the lion's share of these profits go to the entrepreneurs who make and produce the recordings. And all of those are really private companies. You can't, you can't buy them. But there's something Mr. Latham can do, and that is buy some of the Baby Bell stocks, because the Baby Bell companies charge 50% more for a 900 call than they do for an ordinary call. Southwestern Bell is a good example. Yields 4.5% in a growing area of the country. All righty. Now, first of all, I want to thank you with all my heart for dialing our number tonight, you wonderful person. Can't tell you how thrilling it is for us to have you on the line. We have some excitingly intimate confessions we've been waiting to share just with you. And we promise we won't stop talking until you run out of money. <laughs> or credit cards. On the other hand, if your life has already taken too much of a toll, you might prefer the absolutely free advice given to the special pals of Wall Street Week. Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. And that's no line. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, an unusual analyst who seems to hate the industry he covers, let's see why he believes that some of the country's most prestigious financial institutions have long been banking up the wrong tree. First, he says, there's practically nothing a bank does that cannot now be done by somebody else, a broker, an insurance firm, a finance company, whomever, often cheaper with better service and less regulation. Second, he argues, there are too many bum loans. 
and the overall quality is deteriorating, not just in real estate, but in areas as diverse as third world debt and credit cards. Not only is the quality of loans going downhill, he argues, but there aren't enough of them. He thinks banks will be the big losers as corporate debt winds down in the 1990s. There's a double whammy here, he says, since the big fees banks got used to generating in the highly leveraged 80s will not be there during the retrenching 90s, and some previously attractive deals may turn sour. Worst of all, from the bank's point of view, the customers are getting too darn smart. The growing sophistication of depositors in demanding the best return for their savings is putting pressure on bank profit margins, as are high interest rates and a flat yield curve, which means that long-term interest rates are no higher than those for the short term. Is it really time then to take up a collection for your local banker? Or is there a bank window of opportunity here? For some thoughts on that, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, George M. Salem. George, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Good evening. Please have a seat. George Salem has been a renowned analyst of banking stocks for 22 years, but for most of that time, his was a lonely voice in the woods, as he warned of the industry's developing problems. As the London Economist wrote last month, he is almost the only bank watcher on Wall Street who has been consistently and correctly gloomy about the prospects for bank shares. Mr. Salem, who has issued his Dewar forecast for a number of Wall Street firms, has been the senior banking analyst for Prudential Base since 1987. George, now that so many other banking analysts are flocking to join you in the bearish camp, are you ready to fool them by turning bullish? No, not yet, Lou. I think there'll be quite a bit more uh, underperformance for bank stocks. Last week, you wrote the following to your clients. In our view, for the 1990s, the winners and losers in bank stock investing will correlate more with good and bad credit cultures than with any other indicator of bank management performance. Yes. What does that mean? The credit culture is the personality of the bank and how it decides whether to make loans or not. It's the underwriting of the credit. It's how you decide whether this is a good loan or not whether you'll be paid back on time. Can you give me a specific example of a good credit culture and a bad credit culture? Yes, a good credit culture will, will very thorough, thoroughly examine the credit worthiness of the borrower. It will, it will look and make sure they have good collateral. And the, all of the employees of the bank, from the CEO down to the lowliest vice president, will think the same way about a particular loan. Do you know any such bank? I have two or th three banks, actually, which I identify as having superior credit cultures. Morgan Guarantee, whose parent is J.P. Morgan, uh, National Bank of Detroit, whose parent is NBD Bank Corp., and First Wachovia of North Carolina. Given your bearish outlook for the group, would you still buy those three? Well, two of them are buys. Uh, First Wachovia and NBD are buy rated, and J.P. Morgan is not rated by it's rated hold not because of bad loans but because of some of the other pressures coming from uh, the flat yield curve and the absence of revenue coming from deals and mergers etc there's been a lot of publicity recently about the troubles of some of the other leading money center banks clearly you think more bad news is coming Wh which ones would you still sell at this point i would sell several of the money center and regional banks uh, Starting with the money center banks, I would sell Citicorp, Chase, Chemical, First Chicago, Bank of New York, among the money center banks. Among regional banks, there's also a fairly long list, uh, starting with the West Coast banks, First Interstate, Security Pacific, Wells Fargo, moving to the Southeast, SunTrust, uh, First Union, in the Northeast, Bank of New England and PNC, among the stocks that I follow, are all rated sell. Bernadette was just discussing the SNL crisis. To what extent does that contribute to your bearishness about banking? Well, the SNL crisis by itself is, in some respects, a plus for banks because it's removing competition and it's removing some of the heated high, pay, high rates of, that banks have to pay to attract money. But to the extent that the SNLs have been removed from the lending uh, arena, this is putting pressure on real estate borrowers and causing them to starve for credit and uh, affects banks who are also in the same arena lending on real estate. We have 13,000 banks in America. 
West Germany has three, Britain has four. How many banks do you think we'll have in 10 years? Far fewer. I could see the number being cut in half easily. Uh, there's going to be major contraction. The mergers of banks are going to boggle the mind. Some of the biggest banks will merge, and I think the government will encourage it. George, I hope you don't need a bank loan real soon. <laughs> Let me turn you over now to the panel, starting with Marty Zweig. <laughs> George, there's a, an idea or a doctrine that some banks are too big to fail. If a very large bank, over time, got into enough trouble, would the government come in and bail it out or, or not? Yes, I think the government would clearly bail out the bank and make sure that there was no catastrophe for the financial system. But the government has no interest whatsoever in bailing out stockholders. The common stockholder could lose everything, and the depositor would be preserved, and the bank would stay in business, possibly with a new name. George, your two buy recommendations are regional banks. Now, banking nowadays is global. Would those banks ever be large enough to compete in a, a worldwide banking industry? I don't think so. These two banks, NBD and First Wachovia, are regional banks. They're not interested in a global activity. Uh, they'll probably expand domestically over time. They'll have opportunities to buy failed thrifts and failed commercial banks. But the credit culture that they have is one that is not greedy and getting too big is, gonna, is asking for trouble. They'll stay domestic. George, some of my customers want to do what's called bottom fishing. Some bank stocks have dropped, say, from 30 to 15, from 50 to 25. What do you think of that at the present time? I discourage bottom fishing. These are very unusual times in banking right now. You look at a, a bank PE and it looks like it's five or six, but the E part of that PE is totally unknown. The book value of the bank is grossly overstated and the earnings could collapse over the near term. I discourage bottom fishing because I think that we are on, in very unusual times in banking today and there's going to be more pain going out for two to three years, perhaps, in banking. George, is it your view that the banks are mostly victims of history, such as deregulation, allowing new competition, or that they're victims of overweening ambition in taking on too many activities that they should never have taken on? I think it's a little of each, Lou, because in one respect, banks have not been able to be national the way other nations have set up their banking systems. And because of that, banks have had to reach uh, outside this country. That's how they got into their third world debt problem. Uh, and when their loan demand dried up, that's how they went into real estate and LBO lending. I think it's a little of over-regulation and a little over-exuberance and some greed involved. Are we, while over-regulating our own banks, under-regulating foreign banks in America? Probably so. There are foreign banks that have a lot of advantages over our banks. And of course, their home base is very strong for the banks in Britain and Germany and Japan and this allows them to go abroad and possibly have lost leader activities in this country and undercut and compete in this country uh, and, and shave the margins uh, that the American banks have to pay, have to suffer. If we had in this room tonight a John Reed of Citibank or a Bill Butcher of Chase and assuming that they were not strangling you already, what would your advice be to them? Become more cautious in your lending, for one thing. Uh, stop fanning the flames of, of uh, the overbuilt real estate market in America, the overlent, highly leveraged business. And I, and I would urge them to restructure their companies, to think in terms of a much smaller activity, think in terms of possibly merging themselves with another bank and facing the reality of tomorrow whereby they can save a lot of money in overhead by getting together with other banks. The big banking story this week, as I mentioned earlier, was Donald Trump's troubles. Are they significant or is he just his own man? Well, Donald Trump's uh, troubles by themselves are not critical to the banking industry. The loans are spread pretty widely among several banks. The banks that re you read about in the newspaper have a few hundred million each to Donald Trump, but that's not a critical amount because they've sold off and syndicated the loans to other banks. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? I think it's going to be a long workout, and I think that the banks will probably end up putting the loans on non-performing status whereby they stop accruing the interest, and over time they'll probably have some write-offs of principal as well. Based on what you've told us tonight, when's the earliest you'd buy most of those banks? 
I'd have to see the passage of time. I have to see whether the real estate market is going to decline further. Uh, and there, I have to stop you. We'll have to have, have you back in the future and see if you've turned it all. Thanks, George Salem. Thanks, panelists. Hope you'll be back with us again next week. Then we're having our mid-year party. You're most definitely invited. Four panelists whose stock picks are racing ahead of the market this year. We'll be back with new selections, and we'll take an in-depth look at how the U.S. economy has actually been performing and which so-called experts it's likely to confound next. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser has been made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. By the Travelers, insurance and related financial services working to provide financial peace of mind for American business. By Enron, providing natural gas which holds the promise for a cleaner world and a more energy independent America. Enron Corp. and the Enron Foundation. And by Prudential Bates Securities, the investment firm with rock solid resources and market wise thinking in the business of making money. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to Transcripts, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's $5 to Transcripts, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser transcripts are also available to subscribers of the Dow Jones News Retrieval Service. Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is produced by Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. This Chicago presentation of Wall Street Week is made possible in part by Continental Bank Private Banking, where corporate banking expertise is used to provide a sophisticated array of credit, investment, and financial services for executives, entrepreneurs, and private investors.